Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at Platwoods Church. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here. It is great to see so many of you gathered here. I was curious who would show up. And it's great to have those of you worshiping with us online. I know if you're at home, you've got both screens up. I'm just curious which one has the sound on. I hope it's this one. Um, And for those of you in the room, I'm aware that you're all tracking the score on your phones. Just don't spoil it for anybody else. Like, don't cheer at a really inappropriate time. We'll be okay. (laughs) I'm going to need your help getting started this morning. So here we go. Let's see how this goes. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. God is great. God is good. Let us. Okay, okay. Hail Mary, full of grace. That was for the Catholics in the room, former Catholics. There we go. There was like five of you. Good job. Good job. Our Father. (laughs) These are prayers a lot of you know, but none of you wrote them. You weren't the first to pray them. They were given to you, handed down, passed to you as part of a spiritual legacy. Today is a day in the church, as Pastor Matt said, known as All Saints Sunday. It always falls on the first Sunday of November, and I wrote a little bit about it in my e-note this week. But traditionally, churches for well over 1,200 years have marked this day by remembering the lives of the faithful who have gone before us. This can be particularly meaningful to us as we call to mind those we have known and loved personally, but it's also a communal observance for us because it expands our awareness to what the book of Hebrews calls the cloud of witnesses, the throngs of people we have never met, reaching back across millennia deep into our Christian story. It helps us remember the saints of the gospels, those who have walked with Jesus, the martyrs of the early church, whose commitment to Christ cost them their very lives. It helps us remember the early fathers and mothers of the church who put words and music to the faith we try to live. We remember the prophets and the leaders who risked their lives for the justice of the gospel. And we remember the everyday, ordinary humans who ordered their lives around loving God and loving neighbor. And so then their children did, and then their children did, and then their children did. The Christian story is one we do not live alone. We're stepping into a long line of witnesses to the love of Jesus Christ. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before. This is our spiritual inheritance. And later at communion, when we light candles here before us, they will represent so many saints who have gone before us, and we will see the beauty of that legacy all around us. We are individuals, yes, but we are part of something bigger. When we think of the specific gifts that are passed down to us through this communion of saints, one of the most obvious, at least in my mind, is prayer. When we pray, we rarely begin with our own thoughts, our own practices, patterns and rhythms that we came up with all on our own. No, You'll recall from what we just did a moment ago, prayer is passed down to us. We learn it. We mimic it from someone who taught us first. It begins in us when someone else starts writing it on our hearts. And so on this All Saints Sunday, we are beginning our November series, When You Pray. My hope is that today we'll explore a little bit of our own prayer heritage and examine what we've learned and how we've learned it. And then for the next two weeks, we're going to take a closer look at the most important prayer in all of Christian tradition, the one Jesus himself said, when you pray, pray like this, the Lord's Prayer. So, who taught you to pray? Or for those younger or newer in the faith in the room, who is teaching you to pray now? Some of us might have learned from our parents or grandkids, some form of prayer was given to us from a young age. Or maybe you didn't grow up religious, but you've learned from friends or from the movies or from the church as you found your way to it. Or maybe you find yourself here today inexplicably, having never set foot in a church before and you have never prayed before in your life, though I would argue you have, but you're learning now. We start learning this spiritual practice by imitating. 
My immediate family and then my extended family is where I learned to pray as a child. They handed it down to me. I remember for most of my childhood and well into my youth, every prayer that I said began, Dear Jesus, thank you for this nice day. My brother and sister did exactly the same thing for years and years. Dear Jesus, thank you for this nice day, and then whatever else needed to follow. It sounds like we're writing a letter. Dear Jesus. (laughs) But it just sort of became our default salutation to the one who created us. Dear Jesus, thank you for this nice day. Also, it did not matter what was going on outside or in the world around. The opening line never faltered. It could legitimately be a nice day, or it could be rainy and wet and miserable. There could be tornadoes swirling around, or news of earthquakes in California, or volcanoes erupting, and their little Evie would sit at the kitchen table for morning family devotions. Dear Jesus, thank you for this nice day. Over time, and as I got older and began to grow in my experience of prayer, I started thinking more consciously about what I was saying, how it was I wanted to specifically address God. And now, I don't remember the last time I thanked Jesus explicitly for this nice day. I use a lot of different words. But what I see in that early form of prayer is that my parents were giving me a framework They gave me the rhythm of beginning my prayer with gratitude. That first and foremost, before anything else is uttered, I come before my creator with deep, deep thanks. That part of my prayers remains the same today. I rarely start a prayer, public or private, written or extemporaneous, without an acknowledgement of thanksgiving. And it's almost unconscious. That form is written on my heart by those who have come before me. When you pray, chances are, it is like those who came before you. And what is it exactly that we are doing when we pray? When we think of these prayers that we learned, first by rote, by memorizing and repeating, we start to think of prayer mostly in terms of the words we use, but what's underneath that? What are our hearts trying to do when we pray? What is this act in and of itself? I most fundamentally think of prayer as our souls connecting to their source. We are created as spiritual beings, and so our souls have this deep longing to stay connected to the one from which we came. Prayer can become the utterance of our truest truths, the things we know or long to say most deeply, whether that's out loud with words or through movement or silence or even through unintelligible sounds that say more than our words ever can. Think about this for a moment. We all know the Kansas City Chiefs are playing the Miami Dolphins right now in Frankfurt, Germany. And if you had made the choice to watch the game instead of coming to church, and the score were tied with mere seconds left to play, but the Chiefs pulled out a field goal just as the clock ran out, what would happen in your living room in front of the TV? Or what would it sound like in the stands for all the Chiefs fans who traveled to Frankfurt? Fans don't turn to one another and use words. (laughs) Wow, that was truly excellent. I am sincerely grateful I am here to witness this and share in this excitement with you all. (laughs) No. (laughs) What do they do? Show me. Yes. (laughs) We make sounds unintelligible, nonsensical, noisy, and primal. Our souls are crying out their truest truth. We are deeply, ecstatically joyful, too joyful for words to convey. And then, think about it from the other angle. When we are faced with loss, with tragedy, with the most painful pain of our lives. When a piece of our very soul has been wrenched from our lives and we do not know how we will go on living, are there words for that? Do we find ourselves articulating with speech the agony of our hearts? That is not my experience. We cry, we cry out. Our sobs and our groans come out from some place within us we've never felt before. There is no sense to be made of words. Only our sound can contain the truth of what we feel. It is all we can do. 
These times of our utmost joy and our deepest pain are ways that we can think about the most basic forms of prayer, of our souls instinctively reaching to connect with their source. We might think of the fundamentals of prayer then as chiefs and griefs. Thank you. (laughs) You're going to remember it, I promise. (laughs) We see those same patterns, actually, in the book of Psalms, only we have different words for it. We call it praise and lament. And those prayers in our scripture are much more expanded through words and poetry, but they reflect this depth of soul. Father Richard Rohr, a Jesuit priest and contemplative, describes prayer with the metaphor of resonance. He says it's like setting out a tuning fork, so our hearts can begin to resonate with those things within the heart of God. He writes, Prayer is indeed the way to make contact with God, or ultimate reality. But it's not an attempt to change God's mind about us or about events. Such attempts are what the secularists make fun of, and rightly so. It is primarily about changing our mind, so that things like infinity, mystery, and forgiveness can resound within us. So, when we pray, by whatever method, what we are doing over time is writing patterns and postures on our life. We're training our souls how to connect to God's reality, which then changes us and how we exist in the world. I've done a fair amount of pastoral visits over the years to folks who are at the end of life or in advanced stages of memory loss. And it has happened more times than I can count that I will visit briefly with the family who's gathered around with, without any response from their loved one. But I will usually circle them up for prayer at the bedside before I go. And often if the family is religious and if I think that they will know the prayer, I'll end with the Lord's Prayer, inviting them to say it together with me. And on countless occasions, as we collect our voices leading into our Father who art in heaven, the person who I have come to see, having said nothing or responded to nothing this whole time, will chime in, lending their voice to the prayer. The prayer that after so many other faculties and memories have faded, remains written on their hearts. This prayer, the Lord's prayer, is the one Jesus decided to leave for us. This is the prayer he wanted written on the hearts of the people for generations to come. So I want to give a little bit of context and framework today to this prayer that shapes us, and then for the next two weeks, we'll spend time diving deeper into this most important prayer in the Christian tradition. In Scripture, we find the text of the Lord's Prayer in both the Gospel of Matthew and in Luke. There are variances, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But this is not the only prayer we hear Jesus pray. We find him giving thanks before feeding people and sharing meals. All of John chapter 17 is his prayer for unity for his disciples. We hear his words to God even as he is dying on the cross. Jesus prayed a lot of prayers. But what we now call the Lord's Prayer is the only one he taught his disciples or others to pray. And we get two slightly different accounts of how the teaching of this prayer came about. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus has been off by himself praying. And when he comes back, his disciples say, well, teach us to pray. How should we pray? And then in Matthew chapter 6, he offers this prayer unprompted as a part of a much longer teaching on prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's take a closer look here at Jesus' words in both versions of this prayer. The one from Matthew is the one that we follow today when we pray it in worship. And this one might sound a little different than what you're used to saying. I pulled this text from the Common English Bible Translation. That's what we use most often here at Platte Woods. But when we say it in worship, we're, we're pulling back from the old King James Version. It's a little more poetic. It was the first English translation of Scripture. Newer translations, however, that I'm going to pull from here are based upon more reliable Greek versions of the New Testament, which simply were not available in 1611 when old King James was doing his version. So here's Matthew's version. We're going to read this line by line together. Our Father, who is in heaven, 
Uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And then here's Luke. Let's read this one together. Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who has wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation. Different, and yet, not really. The frame and the structure of the prayer is identical. It's clear that when Jesus taught this prayer, the people took note, and it took hold in their lives and in their communities. The fact that two different gospel writers at two different times captured it so closely is quite remarkable to me, and it seems like evidence of its widespread use early on. You might have also noticed there's a line missing from the end that we always tack on there, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Except if you grew up Catholic, you didn't say that line. If you grew up Protestant and have been to a Catholic service, you're always the one that's like rambling on after everyone's, you all know what I'm talking about. Mortifying. (laughs) Stop talking. (laughs) But did Jesus not say that part? Where did it come from? Well, this is another example of spiritual legacy of the saints passing something down to us. It got got added on by early Christians as a doxology. It was handed down generation to generation. And we see evidence of this addition as early as the 200s. So we know it was very early. It's in a document called the Didache. Now, just nerd out with me for a moment. I love this stuff. The Didache, it's not the Bible, but it's a document that describes the practices of the early church. It was referenced in early church writings, so scholars knew that it existed, but they hadn't found it yet. And then a copy of the Didache itself was discovered later in in the 1800s. But the Didache was a guide for early churches. It would circulate describing and prescribing how they were to order their life together. How should worship look together? So it describes, it tells us about baptisms. It tells us how they were doing communion. It gave guidance for how to live a Christian life. And it describes how they should pray the Lord's Prayer. So here it is from chapter 8 of the Didache. You'll notice that it's closest to the Matthew version. Do not pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel, pray thus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so also upon earth. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. And here it's added, for thine is the power and the glory forever. Pray thus three times a day. So from all of these early sources, Matthew and Luke and the Didache, all a little bit different but mostly the same, you can see how we got to the prayer that we still pray today. And the last thing I'll say about the origins of this prayer is what I think is the most interesting. Many people will say or have said that the Lord's Prayer was an original prayer, that Jesus revolutionized how to pray for the Jews and the Gentiles he was preaching to at the time. No prayer like this had ever been taught or given before. And that's a really nice thought, that this was some special gift from Jesus to all of us. And it is. He told us, when you pray, pray like this. But this is the really cool part. Every part of the Lord's Prayer was something that Jesus would already have prayed before. He would have learned the words, give us this day our daily bread from his mother, as a daily Jewish table prayer. He would have offered the words, forgive us our sins, every year at the Jewish feast of Yom Kippur. The Kaddish, a traditional Jewish prayer of mourning, begins like this, exalted and hallowed be his great name in the world which he created according to his will. May he let his kingdom rule. Sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Jesus himself, a Jewish rabbi, had been shaped his entire life by these words and patterns of prayer. Someone had handed them to him first. They shaped his heart 
and the heart of his community. So when it was his turn to teach his followers to pray, the gift was ready to be handed down again. When we pray, prayer shapes us. It will change us. The patterns, the words, the rhythms, the sounds will be written on our hearts and will ultimately cause us to live differently in the world. Because our hearts are reaching toward the heart of God. Over the next two weeks, we'll take a closer look at this gift of a prayer from Jesus. I hope we can hear it in a new way. I hope we will be changed by it. I hope it will cause us to live differently in the world as a gift then to those who will inherit it from us. And so for now, I'll invite you to close with me by joining in this prayer together. But I want to invite you to do something dramatically different than what we've done before. I want to break us out of our pattern of, of praying it so that maybe we can begin to hear it and to feel it, to experience it differently. So if you would, please rise. This prayer was given to the church, to a community. And now this is risky, but to represent the body of Christ, that we are all one in him, I'd like for us to connect to one another. I'd like for you to reach out and join hands with those next to you. You can even come across these aisles, so we're all joined together. If you can't do that today, reach out your elbows or just cross your arms over your chest so that those who are around you can connect around you and you're still embraced in this giant chain. But as we are connected, as we're joined together, as one body and with one voice, as Christ said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.